So greetings, everyone. Here we are, and we are back to Wisdom is Bliss, four friendly fun facts that can change your life. And, uh, of course, we've been doing this over months, weeks and months, and so just to reorient you, we are in the middle of the Eightfold Path, and, um, or the Eight-Limbed Path, and um, another Ashtanga. And in a way, they call it a limb because it's like when you develop spiritual practice, you develop a kind of new body in the Indian way of thinking, in the ancient Indian way of thinking of spiritual science. So your, you know, your faculties like your view, your understanding, your memory, your concentration, your faith, your of your awareness and all of these things become like new limbs you, because you get like a mental body. And we're in the middle of the one, we, we have done the realistic worldview and in the case of Buddhism, which is not ruled by concepts or theories or words as much as it is by experience. It's a path where we're intending to help us have deeper experience of different things. And so whereas other people will translate right view, right motivation, right this and that, I, tra I translate as realistic, because it means the kind of view of life and of the world that is, that is close to what the world is. And uh, any, any individual's view from a limited perspective will be limited, of course. Uh, but uh, the Buddha's view, which is from all perspectives simultaneously, inconceivably so, it will be unlimited. And that's what we seek, because the more we see things from multiple perspectives, the more realistically we understand them. And uh, so the view and then the motivation, once you have a view of reality, then you have a motivation of uh, living and developing yourself in a way that is fits with what reality is. And then the most important thing that comes up actually is in realistic speech. Because words actually are incredibly creative. Words give you the way of interpreting your view, of communicating with others. Words are where you do go out of body because you enter into others' minds when they listen to you. When you listen to them, you, they enter into your mind, you open your mind to them. So realistic speech is really critical to living realistically based on knowing what reality is, which is an interrelativity. And the Thich Nhat Hanh made a wonderful English term, he called it interbeing. We interbe with each other. So everything is relative, is Buddha's great uh, realization. And the absolute that everyone seeks always is the all of the relative, actually. That's, that's a very challenging view, but that was what he came to understand and what he taught. And uh, although in a way you can't just teach that in a way, because it's inconceivable. Absolute and relative are supposed to be opposite, and yet the absolute is all the relative things. In fact, that turns out to be what happens. Then the next one is, so those are those, are those three, th three things, view, motivation, and speech. And that, then we come to action, evolutionary action, emphasizing bodily action, but also mental and speech action. And uh, evolution is how I translate karma, which just means cause and effect, action that is causal, that has an effect. And so it's the network of everything being interconnected to one thing causing another, and then the thing that was an effect causes another thing, and etc. We live in an ocean of intercausation, you could say. And so we're partly through that. It's very long because we have body, speech, and mind. That, um, that, are, that are evolutionary. Because what we think, what we say, and what we physically do, uh, they shape our life. And we evolve, or we can, if we do negative things, we can devolve. We can become worse. If we do positive things, we become better and better. And there's no limit to how good we can get. And luckily, there is a limit to how bad we can get. <laughs> because there are so many because there's no limit to the positive, it crushes any attempt by the negative to be unlimited, put it that way. Stronger than the negative, 
the positive is, luckily. Because the unlimited is, is more than the outnumbers the limited. So anyway, so then we're on page 88. We've done a lot about a lot of, a lot of it about it because it's kind of actually, yeah, I'm praising myself for the last time I did, and I will continue to do that because nobody translates karma as evolution except me. And uh, they go around karma, or they say they think it's fate, something mystical, some sort of religious idea, which it isn't at all. It's a simple observation of how things are caused, and the fact that things are caused, which is counterintuitive for a person who thinks that what they are is something that never changes. That's a fixed thing, like their self, their essence is fixed, it never changes. So it's not caused, that means. Because when you cause something, it changes the thing, the effect gets changed. And also the cause gets changed by a f producing the effect. So an unchanging thing has to be somehow outside of causation. And we have that idea because it's the opposite of everything we see and everything we interact with, which are all relational, causal, interactive. And so we have an idea of the opposite of what we see. In fact, we've never seen an absolute because it, you can't relate to an absolute because it's disconnected from everything. And yet we think that's what we are. So therefore we think our life is problematic because what I really am is something disconnected. And yet everything I keep bumping into it goes in my mind, comes out of my mouth, comes out of my mind. And, I, and, and yet there's something, essential thing is not even connected to all of that. So that's how we have this problematic, doesn't make sense reality. And whereas a scientific reality makes sense. It isn't some abstract thing that mathematics tracks and nobody else can know about. That's a fake thing that scientists talk about like they were high priests or something. The real thing is science is commonsensical, practical, realistic, because it seeks to understand and to relate properly and positively with reality. All right? So now we're coming to subheading the impact of the karmic evolutionary theory. So I really like that it's evolutionary in calling it that because we think the way we are has to do with how we have evolved. And we think that we as a species are continuing to evolve by, the way, by what we do. But we just have, because we came up with a dogma that there's no spirit or soul or mind, even a changeable one, we think we don't have that. So we think it's only our genes that are changing. And so we're changing as a species. We're involving as some kind of collective where nobody's really there in the collective. So we personally don't get the result of any evolution. Ultimately, we think. But that's totally stupid and wrong because we know very well that if we go around doing yoga, we will have a healthy body and we'll be resilient and flexible. We won't have arthritis. We'll be happy and so forth. We'll feel good most of the time. And if we don't do that, we become vegetative and we become unhealthy and stiff and we get arthritis. And so we know that what we do affects us. It, it's, it, we evolve or devolve in relation to what we do. When, we, when we're nice to people, they like us and we have a happy time with them. When we think positive thoughts, we feel good. We think negative thoughts, we are sad, angry, afraid, you know, greedy, dissatisfied, or happy, content, or peaceful. So we know that what we do affects us and we evolve in this life. But there's just the theory that that's all we are, is biological robots with no soul and no mind. And that's just a theory. Nobody ever discovered our lack of soul or mind, actually. They did not. They just make, they just say that. And they act like they, and, and once they say it, they think it's so. And then once they think it's so, they think they discovered it. <laughs> That's what dogmas are. They're not reality, they're just what somebody says. And therefore they can afford not to make sense. But practical things have to make sense because we're living with them. So, okay. So Buddha as a scientist, it begins, once he had perceived the deepest nature of ultimate reality as free emptiness, which is the same as engaged relativity, started this conversation with more other ignorant beings. 
exploring how beings progress and how they regress. And he elaborated this biological causal theory known as karma, which means evolutionary action and reaction. He showed beings how to shape life in positive ways and how the supreme form of life is totally blissful and free as an infinitely loving being, which was himself, actually, and many other Buddhas that he discovered and he, and he coached along the way, fully aware of and merged with all reality. You know, as we are immersed in reality, and when we're fully aware of that, and we're happily immersed, and we love everything in it and everyone, we're completely happy. Beneficial to all, a Buddha is so blissed out that she or he doesn't need anything more for herself or himself, and easily reaches out to include others, therefore. She or he experiences as so unnecessary that anyone should suffer in this realm of life that is essentially bliss, freedom, indivisible. That's what this realm of life really is. Since even its delusion-driven dimensions are found to be permeated, guarded, and shaped by fully blissful and compassionate beings. That is a beautiful thing. You know, in Tibetan art, and I'm certain in Indian art of ancient time, but unfortunately some of the people who conquered India when its people became very, very gentle and vulnerable to conquest by less gentle people, they destroyed a lot of Indian art. They had cave art, they had paintings and all sorts of things, like they still do today. But they very much destroyed that. So we can really understand what ancient Indian art was before they were conquered by outsiders by uh, looking at Tibetan art which can, and Nepalese art, which continues that tradition. Somehow they couldn't destroy everything up in the high mountains. <clears throat> and they sometimes have these paintings where you have a Buddha, and then around the Buddha you have tons of little Buddhas, or you have Tara, and then around the Tara you have tiny little miniature Taras, even the same, looking exactly the same as the one in the main one in the middle. Or sometimes it's just a painting of thousands of, th of them. And what that kind of art signifies is the, 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 the Buddhist, the ancient Indians and the Tibetan Buddhist people feeling that there are many invisible beings who are very, very positive, and they are filling the world around us, although they're invisible. And they always are, want everything to go well, and they don't want us to have pain, and they want us to feel, feel happy, and they want to forestall difficulty and danger. But of course, people can insist on creating difficulty and danger. They do, and uh, sometimes, but they're always there trying to help, is the point. So feeling the world to be like that, it's like, in a way, it has become my main purpose in teaching what little bit that left that I do as a retired person, what little teaching I still do, is helping people come to a view of life where they no longer fear reality. In fact, they feel embraced by reality, and they feel comfortable and at home in reality, no matter what's going on. And in order to do that, of course, one has to cope with the idea of death and losing consciousness and trusting oneself when one no longer can sort of keep conceptual hold over and control over what's around one. Like, and we do that every night, actually. Every single night, we go unconscious to fall asleep. And we like doing it because we know that we'll feel better after we've slept. But letting go is the kind of where we become completely vulnerable because we're unconscious. We don't know. You know, some tick could crawl up on our skin. Some monster could blow up the house. You know, we, don't have, we have no idea what might happen when you go totally unconscious. So we kind of surrender our agency every time we fall asleep. And uh, maybe some people get very paranoid, very frightened of what's around them, and they can't sleep. And then, but, but then you die if you don't sleep for about 20 days. You can, a human being will not survive if they don't sleep for well, maybe it's 27, or, some, or sometimes I, or I thought I heard it was 17. But if you absolutely do not sleep for less than a month, I'm pretty sure, you, you, get, you, you can die. 
So we really need that where our body is just completely on its own and the consciousness has no control over it or its environment. And so <clears throat> that's what happens in death. So then at that point, reality does with you what it wants to do. And if you're scared of reality, then you're afraid of death. And that's what most of us are because the cultures teach us we need religion, we need God, we need Jesus, we need Krishna, we need somebody, Buddha, to help us after we die because we will be, we're helpless. So, and reality is scary without someone helping. But actually, Buddha's discovery was that reality itself is total goodness, total energy, totally sustaining, total life force, and it will provide us with all the means of having even a better life than we had before if we're really open to it. That was his discovery. And so that means then when you, it doesn't mean you should go and try to die because then you can do better right away because if you, unless you're completely open to that and you've achieved that the complete openness of enlightenment, you might freak out when you're in the process of surrendering your voluntary consciousness, you could say. But if you have cultivated an openness to reality by developing faith and trust in reality, then you'll be fine no matter life or death. It will be one beautiful flow of the life force, and which is the bliss force, the freedom force. It won't even insist that you do whatever you do. You can just be it, and that'll be fine. But then you will naturally want to do something if you develop that Buddha awareness. Why? Because you'll see that other people are just like you, perfectly fine, even animals, any kind of being, even some tarantula or some horrible creature, cobra. But they don't know that, so they're fighting with the world. They're fighting with other beings. They're, they're suffering themselves, and they're being beaten up themselves, and they are beating up others, and so on. And then you see that is totally unnecessary for them when you get that totally open mind of Buddhahood. And so then you, there's, it's very boring to be so happy and free, in a way, there's, because there's, you don't need to be released from anything, because everything is a release. <laughs> so then... The only thing that's fun is helping other people discover that. And telling them something about that, if you gain a body again with a mouth and you have words and a language and you talk to them, has a limited benefit because they, they can't fully understand, the words can't fully express the miraculousness of reality. So, but you can coach them on the other hand, you can encourage them, you can help them out. So that's what you naturally, that becomes your sole occupation actually. So Buddha is just there for us, you know. So that's really, so shaped by fully blissful and compassionate beings, those are beings whose whole gig is to help us out. And they're visible ones and invisible ones. The guru that we find, if we find a good spiritual teacher, then that's a visible one, a spiritual friend, they call it actually in Buddhism, more than the sort of authority guru figure. But they, that some of them can be gurus sometimes. So such is the amazing biological theory of the Buddhas as scientists. When we catch a glimpse of it, we can quickly see the flaws of the theory of dogmatic materialism, positing that everything consists of mindless atoms and molecules. It, meanwhile, they've discovered now with quantum that they don't even know what an atom or a molecule really is. They can't really pin it down. It's really one big meaningless nothingness, they say, which we can supposedly verify just by destroying our brains or bodies. So the sort of unconscious darkness that we fall into when we first fall asleep, they reassure us that's all that will happen to us when we die. Which is kind of nice in a sense that at least there's no pain there. But it's sort of also, it's, it is boring and it's actually totally disconnected from all life. Nothing would be utterly disconnected because in a way it doesn't exist. So that's kind of un unhappy. It's less happy than being a vast energy of bliss, wouldn't you say? An infinite le free energy of bliss? I think that's more fun than being nothing, actually. Because you're still interconnected with the beings that you love and the things that you love, and you can benefit them and you can do things for them. So that's more fun, I think. Anyway, uh, that's what the materialists tell us. And in a way, if, if you were before that, the materialists arose in Europe, in most, they, were, they existed in India actually and China and everywhere. Every society has had them. But they became a dominant majority in Europe 
based on the West. And, uh, and that was, a, in a way, a useful thing for a while, because before that, some very authoritarian religious people had scared everybody that they were probably going to hell because they might be had too much fun or they were they weren't obeying some some boss and so they, they they were a little bit terrorized they were a little bit terrorized by their religion so to then hear from scientists supposedly that there was nothing to fear was kind of actually good for them on the other hand when they make an extreme out of it, it makes them reckless in how they live because they feel that there's no positive consequence of anything positive that they do. So then they feel recklessly capable of doing whatever. And therefore, they're wrecking the planet, actually. Because they think, well, if, if the worst comes to worst, the whole planet just blows up, then everybody will just not exist and they won't regret that they once did and got blown up. That's unfortunately the recklessness of our modern culture. So better than that is the idea that everything is an infinite positive matrix of a life force and that there can be infinite love, infinite compassion, infinite joy, and that all beings can share in that with each other. That's really, that's the ideal, right? And actually that's what Buddha said is the case. This is a Buddha land. This is a Buddha verse, not a universe, but a Buddha verse. So I really like it myself, anyway. So, uh, what did I say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here, here. Uh, so, such is the amazing biological theory of the Buddhas. When we catch a glimpse of it, we can quickly see the flaws of the theory of dogmatic materialism, right? Positing that everything consists of mindless atoms and molecules. It, and that it's really one big meaningless nothingness, which we can supposedly verify just by destroying our brains or bodies. The fact that we think of ourselves as alive and sensitive is just an accidental trick of atoms and molecules, our genetic coding giving us the delusion of being alive for a purpose. The scientists, but that's not really true. In other words, the scientists, there's no purpose to it. The scientists tell us, the modern scientists. The scientists are seeking to gain full control of this coding so as to make the delusion of existence temporarily more comfortable until we die. Since this life is a delusion, and really meaningless and purposeless, even such a great philosopher as Wittgenstein felt that ethics had no grounding in reality. Being good or bad is just a matter of free choice, as there is really no overarching reason to be good or bad. That's the problem of nihilism, right? In Buddhist theory, however, the way we experience life is delusive because we don't exist in the way we think we do. The way we really exist, and we do really exist, is as interconnected, in a way of being interconnected with a universe of abundant energy that fulfills every need and overcomes every pain and difficulty. We do have the ability to come to understand and experience that by cutting ourselves free from the knots of the delusion of our alienation, our paranoid feeling that we're different from everything else and they'll, they'll get us if we don't defend ourselves, etc., etc., as humans, we have the special ability to do that, and indeed, we should congratulate ourselves for having achieved the human life form, which brings us within range of replacing ignorance with wisdom once we confront and realize our true nature. That's a good one. Don't you like that? Actually, we're better off than the gods, they actually say. Uh, because there are and there are three different types of gods. There's the desire realm gods who are like having one huge party, but that gets kind of boring, and they eventually get tired of it, and they're still impermanent, and they're still self-centered, so they always want more and more, even though they have every pleasure we could think of, of no normal sort of self-centered pleasure. Then there are gods of the realm of pure form where they don't really need to party because their whole life is a party, their being is a party. But the problem is they're not, they, they're not able to share that with other beings because they're in this kind of aloof, heavenly, celestial type of place, apart from the beings who are suffering. And they kind of know that there are other beings who are suffering, but they feel disconnected from them. So it's not really Buddhahood, those gods. But there's, there's tons of them, on the other hand. And they're also, unfortunately, impermanent. They reach that state for 
from having been very generous, very wise, and so on, but never overcame the sense of ego, the sense of I'm me separate from other things. But they just made it kind of really nice, and yet they are they went and sort of they went to a gated community, <laughs> you could say, where they just hang out and they and they uh, do it. And then finally, some of them feel even that's boring. So they still are caught, as the being can be, who is self-centered, and thinking that, well, the only problem may be because they still have bodies. So if they go into a realm of pure mind or pure quiet, maybe that will be sort of their final absolute. They'll reach absolute that way. And abs In other words, they will, they will find that reality is similar to, what the, to the unchanging, fixated self, absolute self that they think they are. So they'll leave all embodiment, at least coarse embodiment. They actually can't leave all energy, but they'll, subtle energy, but they'll leave all coarse embodiment. And those are the gods of the formless realms, what are called the immaterial realms, which are re where there's no coarse matter, and where they are, it's called the realm of infinite, there's only four of them, although I'm sure there are gradations within them, but they only talk about them as four. Infinite space, infinite consciousness, beyond consciousness and, no, infinite uh, nothingness, a seeming nothingness, and beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. And those are the four formless gods, you know. But all of those gods are less fortunate than humans in the Buddhist worldview because they are, not, they are, they are, they have reached various dimensions of disconnection. So they are still caught in the delusion of being something different from other things. And they, they, they are able to be that way they're in a very enjoyable way, and they're incredibly intelligent. Quite a, but but they, that, that basic thing about what is, who, who am I, what am I, they haven't really addressed that, actually. They haven't gone to figure out what they are, is the problem. So they still think that they have this sort of fixed self. So, by contrast, the human has that equal intelligence to those gods, actually, which the monotheistic traditions are kind of be aware of. They say the human intelligence is like a spark of the divine intelligence, and that's true. But then the thing about the humans are we're very vulnerable to pain, and we're very close to the, lo the lesser animals who are, who are eating each other, you know, and running around surviving, you know, trying to survive, and they're in constant conflict with each other. And then there are even worse states that, you know, like hellish type of states that we could be in and we're kind of aware of in some way. Although they're stupid that we think somebody else puts you there. That's not possible. You create that yourself by becoming more and more alienated. You become more and more isolated and, and you can encase yourself in an iron, iron prison, really, because then you're sick. You, no one can break into, break into you. But then you're trapped there also and crushed there. So... So you can make a hell for yourself. And we see humans do it in war. They make a hell for themselves temporarily. But anyway, we're in this middle place, in other words, in the, in the forms of, among the forms of life. And we have that intelligence. And then we have people who have become Buddhas among us, historically at least. If there are, I think there are a few around in the world, but not, but not as many, not too many, unfortunately. But it may be enough for, for our abilities. There may be enough. They say, if you're ready, you will find the enlightened guru. And they say, there'll be one there. <laughs> it's, it's, even though it sometimes doesn't seem likely to us. Everyone seems to be the same to us, in fact. People think that because they don't want to have to change themselves. So anyway, okay, so from a Buddhist perspective, every human has in previous lives, because, well, that's another really great one that I really like, where we have been... Our, our life force is beginningless. This is the Buddha's solution of the chicken and egg problem. No problem. Chickens and eggs all the way back, infinitely, infinitely back. So in a way, there's no first beginning. There are cycles, and there are, first, there are places where chickens and eggs can't flourish temporarily, but the chicken-egg continuum is there in other worlds at that same time. So everything is beginningless. And we've been living beginninglessly in our limited way. And so that's a very important point. So every human has in previous lives been every kind of animal. And every animal actually has been human because you can, de you can devolve from human to a lesser animal. 
And both will be, and you go up to God realms and come back down to human and come down to animal. And actually, one of the dangers of the God realms is that you will come down to a lesser than human life form, especially if you go to the formless realms, to the immaterial realm, because when you're in a realm where you don't have a body, it becomes like, and you sort of even in states that seem to be kind of like infinite, like infinite nothingness or infinite space, then you, your sense of differenti of discernment, of discrimination, of being able to tell good from bad, becomes atrophied, and you become very dull-minded, actually. So then stupidity will lead you to a lower animal form. There's a danger when you finally lose that, that formless realm um, uh, and disembodiment as an disembodied god. So anyway, in both of the, in every one, every other one's form at some future point as well, if we keep going on, on constant self-centered, constant rebirths and reincarnations, unless and until anyone becomes a perfect Buddha, becoming all of the beings at once, so to speak. It is under, in other words, there, that, that is like the peak of evolution, where you, it doesn't mean that you have no more life. In fact, you have infinite numbers of lives because you are one with the infinite life force. And at that point, you become aware of how many zillions of other beings are suffering. And you're able to embody yourself in ways that can interact with them in optimal ways to help them evolve positively. It's what's called the nirmanakaya, the body of emanations. That's what you can do. And, uh, and uh, so... So you, you then have infinite life, actually, when you become a Buddha. So it's not, you don't have no more lives. You hear a lot in Buddhism about no more lives, because in dual, there's a dualistic form of Buddhism where nirvana is presented as if it was something else, or they're allowed to think that, rather than nirvana is right here, which is the higher form. But in that one where nirvana is somewhere else, then you have an idea that you can escape, you need to escape from life. And those are for people who can't imagine that you could be perfectly alive and perfectly there and engage with everybody else and yet turn perfectly happy and thereby able to help others heal their sufferings. In fact, it's too good to be true for, for those people. And so for them, the Buddha allowed them to think that freedom from suffering would be some sort of alternative reality. Whereas this is actually an alternative reality from what the ignorant, self-centered person thinks it is. Right, but it does. It's no different from what it is. It's just not what we think. It is understandable. So you, when you become a perfect Buddha, you become all of the beings at once, so to speak, because you become totally empathetic to everybody else, and you can also be beings that interact with them. You can become many at once. It is understandable in some cultures where people have to treat other species as enemies or as food, even that they cannot imagine creatures as sentient. They therefore have no connection with the animal realm in some cultures, right, because they just eat them, right? They therefore, and, and modern West was like that. Even today, there are scientists who are, they are not quite sure that this and that animal that they experiment on really feels anything, because they don't really have a consciousness. They actually think that. And even the proof that gorillas have consciousness, that chimpanzees have consciousness, is only very, very recent in the West. Whereas they, they totally knew that in India thousands of years ago, and in China and other places. They knew they were sentient. That some of them were still meat-eating, but they were mainly vegetarian, actually. They therefore have no connection with the animal realm. For Buddhist scientists, the great variety of evolutionary life is more like an ocean filled with an infant variety of struggling forms of life. Buddha differed with the Jains and did not include the plants as sentient beings, saying they don't have the same kind or degree of sensitivity. Of course they are sensitive, but perhaps more accepting of where they anchor, put down roots. The difference is not just sentient or insentient, in the way Buddhist language talks about the difference between plants and animals, but they say moving or unmoving is the difference, migrant or non-migrant beings. Buddha as a biologist is really a lot like Darwin as a biologist. Both agree about the kinship of humans and animals, and therefore both are strongly resisted by Caucasian monotheists and creationists who don't want to be connected to monkeys even genetically, <laughs> as they are habitually speciesist, racist, and, uh, and sexist. 
considering themselves superior to red, yellow, or black humans, and maybe green porpoises and blue porpoises, and if they are males, they consider themselves superior to females. Amazingly, in Asia from Buddha's time, although high caste Brahmins in India and upper classes in other Asian lands resisted the idea of being reborn as lower caste persons or animals, dogs, etc., or worse, they were also overwhelmed, so to speak, by the greater number of beings who adopted the realism of the Buddhist inner scientists and learned to delight in the kinship with the animals. The Indian nations, for example, became more or less completely vegetarian in culture, feeding into the evolutionary action of the day. So it's, why did I write that? Feeding into the evolutionary action of the day. <laughs> I think an editor wrote that phrase. In, in harmony with, I, I, don't, I don't like the word feeding there, in harmony with the evolutionary action of the day, I think, of being nonviolent, ahimsa, you know. I just don't like the word, I don't think I would have used feeding. So as mentioned briefly before, there was less resistance to Buddha's karmic biology in India, and it spread swiftly around Asia. People accepted the theory thoroughly. Buddha's karmic biological evolution theory was not widely accepted in India before his time, in fact, actually. The general Vedist theory, you know, you know the Hindu, nowadays Hindus think they were always Hindus, but actually Hinduism is very different from Vedism. You know, the, that which was that, or, although they still honor the Vedas, but the Vedas were quite different in their sort of worldview. They, for example, the Vedas had no idea and no theory of liberation. They only had three aims of life, which were pleasure, you know, wealth and success and uh, 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 religion, you know, being faithful, dutiful within the sort of the gods, to be dutiful to the gods. They didn't expect to be liberated, in other words, in some sort of transcendent reality. But they didn't have the fourth aim in Hindu life, which is moksha, which is liberation, the other freedom. They only had dharma following, and dharma meant to them religious rules or laws. And so those were their three aims of life of the Vedas. So they were different from Hindus, actually. But anyway, their general Vedas theory was that the fortunate member of the twice-born upper classes could join the human ancestors in a kind of happy hunting ground after death, a kind of heaven, and less fortunate persons would simply revert back into the soil to become food for future generations, fortune being determined by the will of the gods as shaped by the karma of ritual offerings, because that was the meaning of karma in the Vedic thing was ritual actions. Because that, that to them were the powerful actions. When you made an offering to appease the gods, or the, usually many gods, but at, at least one, then they would bless you with a positive outcome in your life. But you weren't seeking an outcome of freedom, complete absolute freedom. You didn't think of that. But you would like to go to heaven and practically be almost like a god, as an ancestor. That was the ideal thing. So therefore, the powerful action that you could do in life was to make offerings in the rituals. And the Brahmins were the specialists in making the offerings, and the Kshatriyas and the Vaishyas, the upper caste uh, ones but beneath the Brahmins in their theory, uh, they would get the, the priests to do it. They became the sponsors of the priests to do that. So then they would climb in the caste system to a higher status. But there was no question of going beyond all status, if you follow me. Buddha's teaching on karma instead of ritual causation as ethical causation show how actions increase or decrease the quality of your lives. So in other words, it's not what you offer to the gods, it's what you do with other people. I mean, it could be being nice to some gods if they were unhappy or they needed something, but it was also mainly being nice to other people uh, and being kind and being ethical and generous and self-restrained and blah, blah, you know, the usual ethical thing. A shape, not killing them, and so on. You know, show how actions increase or decrease the quality of your lives. You become what you do. If you are loving, kind, and generous, then you will become happier, healthier, wealthier, and more beautiful. Though you still might suffer in the short term due to previous negative actions in previous lives, if you persist in the positive, the fruit of positive evolution and happier lives is never lost. 
emerging in the future of that very life or in future lives. In modern times, there was a famous argument between the well-known anthropologist Ashley Montague and the ethologist Conrad Lorenz as to whether the human is basically a social animal or an aggressive one. Buddha, alongside the Dalai Lama, goes with Montague's argument that the human is basically a social animal. Of course, humans can make horrendous bombs and weapons of mass destruction using the power conferred by their sociality and language, which then contributes to their intelligence, manipulative intelligence, and so can be far more destructive than other animals. But that comes from the greater intelligence being misused, whereas the actual form of the human body-mind comes from being moral and ethical and compassionate when living in less intelligent animal embodiments. If you connect this, in other words, the, the lion who lets the pregnant deer escape and, and eats the old grizzly one, you know, is being generous in that way. She's not eating the fat pregnant one. And that enables that one to go on. And so that's a kind of self-restraint and a kind of generosity, since the, 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 the younger one is going to be more juicy to eat. But they'll eat an old one and leave that one alone. So animals also have... Can, can make some, they have option, a little bit of optionality, nothing compared to human, but something compared to nothing. So, so the, the actual form of the human body-mind comes from being moral and ethical when living in less intelligent animal embodiments. If you connect this insight to the tenfold path of evolutionary skill, or lack of evolutionary skill, you can see how being, remember I, use, I told you about how skill and virtue can be interchangeable in the Sanskrit language. You can see how beings can work their way up in tiny baby step increments through the forms of the less and less malicious animal, animals, you know, uh, by being a little bit generous as an animal. And like becoming a mammal even is a step up because then the mammal, the females of the mammals have the young inside their bodies, so then they know they're interconnected, there's a much deeper sense of interconnection than just laying an egg and defending it in the sand there somewhere, you know, or leaving it just on its own in the sand. In other words, the mammal becomes uh, more altruistic and being willing to have a body inside your own body, type of thing. So, the lion who is less angry with other animals, who has fleeting surges of compassion toward other lions, for example, becomes a less predatory animal in following lives. The human's multi-optional life niche gives it more time and better equipment for skillful action and even fun, in fact. Just try to find better than human foreplay among the more hardwired, less soft, soft wired animals. In Buddha's theory and laws of evolution, Humanity comes from ethical, other-regarding actions, first occurring via tiny surges of sympathy in the mind, and then in expression from grunts and mating songs up to articulate speech, <laughs> and finally in social physical actions. For example, from a karmic evolutionary perspective, if you possess wealth as a human, that comes from past generosity. If you possess beauty, that comes from past patience and tolerance, the ability to absorb injury without reactive rage, remaining calm under stress, and using skill and strategy to lessen injury all around. Buddha turned away from his birth class of royal warriors and favored the merchant classes who restrain violence for gain and prosper by fair exchange, living by that relatively win-win approach. So that's the end of that chapter. I always like I always used to give a argument, give a lecture to business people that business is really good because it isn't war. War is also at first war would seem to be a good business because you kill the, the customer and you take everything they own. <laughs> so it should be better than ordinary business where you exchange. Because you have to give something to get something. But actually, the problem with killing your customer is they're not there for next year's purchases and exchanges. And they don't produce something that you can then change to someone else for other value. So it's a much more, a much, it's a, it's a zero-sum form of business that is much less prospering than businesses. But, and then therefore, those businesses that become too piratical and too destructive to their customers are because they have too short a... a a profit span 
that they're looking at, rather than a more longer-term one, they eventually self-destruct as businesses. And actually, business people do so like that, kind of. It fits with Max Weber, fits with Max Weber's great theory about the Protestant ethic, that the key to modern industrial success, whatever, with the good side of it, not the over-industrialized, self-defeating form, but the good side of it was the generosity, in a way, capitalism relates to generosity in Weber's sociological analysis, which people always lose nowadays, and the lefties completely don't get. But it actually is the case, because to, if you consume less than you produce, that creates capital, and therefore that can then produce more stuff. So there's a positive cycle in consuming less than you produce. You know, it's like Rockefeller sitting there counting pennies. You know, you know. But of course, it can be stupid and miserly. But but in the sense of self-restraint of greed, in order to produce and create more, is positive. Actually, it is good. Of course, everything when it becomes extreme is no good. So okay, so that's the whole thing. That's a, that is a whole session, and it was just a few pages at the end of the karmic one. But it's so important. I'm glad to have spent more time on it. Okay, so think about what you think. Think about what you say, think about what you physically do, and realize that everything that you do is creative, because at the very least it's creating your future state of being. And when you speak positive, your speech will get better and better. When you think positive, your life will get better and better. When you act positively, your body will get better and better. So that's the story. You know? and, then, and there's no limit to that. Because it, the results will not only be experienced in the body that you have in any particular life, you're looking at a future series of infinite lives, and there's no limit to how good you can be, and how wonderfully you can enjoy, how miraculous your life can be. So that's, this is the karma thing is, karmic evolution is wonderful and important, and so think about it and enjoy it. And I'll talk to you next week, where I will deal with sort of immediate karma, which is livelihood, realistic livelihood. That's what we'll do next time, okay? Thank you very much. But to dedicate the merit, ke wa di in yur du dan, ce sun jang yon trub jur ne, to a ti jam mala ba di sala gur show. So by this virtue of having given this class and having listened to this class and thinking it through, may we quickly become enlightened in order to be able to help everybody else become free of suffering and enlightened. Thank you.